Well, first, uh, let me say how honored I am to be, um, even by cyber, uh, invited to a conference in the UK where I have been banned uh, for the past six or seven years. If I'm not mistaken, it's a permanent ban. Um, so I tip my hat to your courage for having me. Uh, mind you, I am an individual um, rights activist, a human rights activist, who is dedicated to freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, and equality for all before the law. This is my crime. I have never advocated for violence or, or genocide. And it's interesting to me that the UK continues to welcome the most vicious hate preachers, uh, Shaquille Begg and so on and so forth, while denying entry to my colleagues uh, and myself. So thank you, Anne-Marie Waters. Um, Garland is interesting. The Texas event is interesting first because it was a response to the Charlie Hebdo um, attacks in Paris. We had decided to hold a conference in Garland, Texas, and just to give you some background, why Garland, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because Muslim leaders in the United States, just days after that wholesale slaughter, held a conference in Garland, Texas, not in support of our First Amendment rights, but in support of the ideology behind those attacks, in support of the Sharia. It was called Stand with the Prophet, in defense of the Prophet. And this was in response to what Charlie Hebdo, that satirical French magazine, had been doing by exercising their freedom of speech. So after these Muslim leaders held a conference, I, in the same venue, in the same room, decided to hold an art exhibit. And the art exhibit was showing how Muhammad had been depicted for the past 1,400 years. And in that 1,400 years, people weren't necessarily always being slaughtered and killed for depicting Muhammad. But here we are seeing this violent intimidation today in the 20th, 21st century to silence people and to impose the Sharia on the West. So that's the background to Garland. And we also at the same time invited artists to express their First Amendment rights, their free speech rights, if they wanted to submit a cartoon or drawing and so on and so forth. And so now it becomes the cartoon contest. It really wasn't that. It was to show that you could exhibit uh, Muhammad and not necessarily live under pain of death. But what, on, you know, on the contrary, what happened was jihadists opened fire on our event. They shot a security guard in the leg. And if it wasn't for my security team, I always have a security team around me. And at that particular event, I also had a SWAT, a SWAT team. It was our SWAT team that took out, killed the two jihadists. And of course, I'm sure you, you're, you and your, your attendees are aware after the aftermath of that event was people blamed me. Mm -hmm. It was like blaming the rape victim for a short skirt. Um, and I don't think people understand that this accommodation to these, these um, vicious demands, uh, abridgment of our freedoms, nearly give way to more demands. There's no satisfaction. And so this was the point. The point was to stand for the freedom of speech. Uh, I wasn't being a provocateur. We hear that all the time. The fact that I, the fact that I stand for the First Amendment. And if Muslims come to the West, then they too must stand for the First Amendment. And this is what is unique in this particular immigration group. Unlike other immigrants, Muslims come to the West with a ready-made model of society that they believe to be superior, and they seek to impose it. And I oppose this. Absolutely, absolutely, and as do I. And we have exactly, I suppose, the same situation in the UK. Uh, unique among immigrant groups is a Muslim refusal to adapt to British freedoms or what used to be British freedoms. I did attempt a Muhammad cartoon uh, exhibition in London um, 
just couldn't do it. I mean, I just didn't have the means to defend myself, uh, first of all. And secondly, we, when we did find a venue, as soon as, you know, she knew what we were doing, uh, she was very brave, uh, but as soon as, as it, the, the, it got heavy, she said, look, I just can't risk this, I'm so sorry. Um, so it was, it was, it was I mean, it was, wasn't the nightmare that you experienced. Um, so after, after that, you had a, another attempt on your life. Um, someone wanting to, to behead you, and you were, you were taken into protective... Yeah, there had been, needless to say, there had been multiple threats. I mean, look, the Islamic State, ISIS, issued an official fatwa uh, on my head. But the one that you're referring to uh, was in action. Yeah. Uh, you had uh, three jihadists uh, who had plotted to behead me. Uh, the origins of the plotters were in Boston. And uh, one of the jihadis uh, was making his way to New York and was stopped by the Boston police. And one thing led to another and they lunged at the Boston police and th that forced the police to, to kill him. Uh, but the, this is a very serious thing. You mm -hmm. see? And uh, uh, this is what we have to live with. And Honestly, you know, people are always saying to me, scratching their head, saying, aren't you afraid? And I have to reply, aren't you afraid of doing nothing? This is not static. This is a fluid situation. Look where we were. Uh, and this is, of course, what got me involved in the fight previous to 9-11. I was your quintessential New York City career girl. Honestly, I was apolitical. I assumed my freedom. Love my art, my music, my fashion, love my job. Uh, I assumed my freedom. I felt that the good cops were on the beat. You know, we had defeated evil after World War II. We were living in sort of a post-historical age. And I was wrong, really wrong. And 9-11 just shook me. And uh, it just smashed the whole, my whole foundational thinking. I didn't know who had attacked the country. And when I found out, I, I didn't understand why they had attacked the country. And so I set about to, to learn. And I read the Quran and in Bachayor and Ibn Warwick and, and Robert Spencer. And this was my crime. And this was my crime. My crime, and this is the crime of anyone who stands up against jihad terror and Sharia oppression. Uh, you become an Islamophobe, become an, an, a racist, an anti-Muslim bigot, a racist, Islamophobic, anti-Muslim bigot, merely because you oppose jihad terror and Sharia oppression. And this is, this is Sharia. That's what Sharia is. You cannot criticize Islam. You cannot criticize Islamic law. And uh, that's what you're seeing in the criticism of myself. Notorious anti-Muslim. I'm not anti-Muslim. Anyone that says that about me, A, is not familiar with my work, and B, is actually the true Islamophobe, because they're painting all Muslims as jihadists. That's what they're doing. I mean, there's nothing is ever said about the work that I do uh, with Muslim girls who are living in households in the West um, who want to be free, who don't want to wear the hijab, who want to lead Western lives. And because of this, their lives are in danger. And to this day, I mean, I can't freely talk about it because their lives are more important to me than good PR. But anyone who's out there watching, all you lurkers, and I know you're there because you email me, that need help, girls who want to be free should contact me at PamelaGeller at gmail.com because every individual, every human being has the right to live free. And that's what you and I fight for. Absolutely. I mean, you said it, it was 9-11 that sort of started your, your journey here. How many New Yorkers do you think had the same response to you? I mean, is it, is it common among New Yorkers to have reacted this way? Did they, did they go out and learn? Did they understand it better as you did? Let me say this. 18 years has made an enormous difference. I would have to say that in many ways, the jihadis were quite successful in 9-11. First, because America didn't even, wasn't even aware of Islam. 
didn't, uh, wasn't remotely interested, as Americans aren't, aren't interested in most things in the world, except America. Um, and it was a watershed. It was in many ways successful. Uh, look, I led the fight against the Ground Zero Mosque. Yes. It was a 16-story mosque in a building that was destroyed in the 9-11 attacks where human remains were found. And according to CNN, which is, you know, colloquially known as the Crescent News Network here, uh, over 70% of Americans were against it. And, and we won that. We won that battle. But understand, and, and understand the President Obama and um, the mayor of New York City and the entire media was fervently in favor of this mosque. And they really were clubbing the American people to death, as you see in the UK, um, with the Dawah, with the, you know, I think the biggest mistake, if you could point to certain historical moments in looking back, I think the biggest mistake that was made was President Bush, uh, one or two days after 9-11, going before America and the world, you know, urging us to understand that Islam is a religion of peace. And he's surrounded by these terrified groups like the Council of American Islamic Relations who are unindicted co-conspirators in the largest terrorist t funding trial in our nation's history, the Holy Land trial, and in Muslim American society, another Muslim Brotherhood proxy, and so on. I mean, that was an, a teachable moment. That was an important moment uh, that he, you know, was he clueless? Was he complicit? It doesn't matter. The outcome was the same. Um, this idea of it being a religion of peace and so on and so forth. And we get that all the time. I mean, I can't help. I watch these British. I, I like British. I like crime dramas. And I watch these British crime dramas. And it's just it's, it's just astonishing to me that every murderer is, you know, he's a white nationalist, he's a racist, and the victim is a migrant. And I mean, you, uh, the UK is roiled in, in, in jihad terror. And never do I see it depicted, ever, it, you know, in, and this is a constant, constant barrage of propaganda on mm -hmm. every level. It's not just the media, it's entertainment, it's the BBC, it's, it's, it's all of these movies. And even here, it astonishes me that since 9-11, there has not been one movie from the brave men and women of Hollywood. They're so brave. They're always giving themselves awards. Every, every month there's another award and the chances they took. And not one movie with the exception of Flight 93, which was basically, it was just a couple of years after 9-11, it was basically a transcript of what went on in the cockpit. It's a good movie because it's, it's really real. It's the actual words of what was going on in that plane that flew into the towers but there's not been one movie about not, this is how afraid the West is. The West is so afraid of Islam and, but so brave in bullying people like myself and you so brave in destroying, destroying our, our, our good names, destroying our ability to make a living. I mean, that's a form of murder to ruin someone's good name is a form of murder. And that's what they do. And no one is safe. And the quintessential example, is President Trump. What you see happening to President Trump is what's been happening to all of us on the right uh, since, uh, I don't know, since Stalin, <laughs> you know, because really it goes back that far. Yeah. People, don't, people don't understand the marriage, the toxic marriage of Islam and the left. And it's absolutely irrational. I mean, the left loves control. A hundred years ago, it was uh, Trotsky. It, you know, it was it was Stalinism. It was communism. It was the Nazis. It was the it, which was the National Socialist Workers Party. They love control. What better system of control? What better system of governance is there than the Sharia? Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, if you're going to have a totalitarian government and you want a religion to put into it, you can have no better. Islam is the religion of the totalitarian. And people make the mistake 
you hear it all the time of why is the left so uh, you know it's about women's rights and gay rights and why is the left in bed with this uh, they think it's a mistake it's not a mistake it's absolutely appropriate they're willing to look away from women's rights and gay rights the left is but it's absolutely appropriate that they should have this relationship with islam the enemy of my enemy is my friend and may, if they should triumph, uh, people say, oh, well, you know, what's going to be between the left and Islam? You know what? The left is very brutal, very vicious, oh, yeah. has a terrible history. Look, yeah. outside of war, Stalin uh, murdered 100 million people. Outside of war, oh, believe me, they have absolutely no compunction about violence. And, and they are certainly not worried about the Islamic world. They will put them down they're thinking in a heartbeat. They're not worried about them. But right now, they're very useful to them. So you said we're afraid of Islam. Why do you think that is? Because they're violent. <laughs> yeah, as simple as that. I mean, because they're violent. Because, uh, you know, they'll go in and they'll slaughter an entire um, editorial office in Paris. Yeah. That's why. And then the government will co-opt the movement. I mean, Je suis Charlie was a government movement. You saw who was leading those marches. I mean, it was a joke. The West response to jihad terror is painfully embarrassing. The teddy bears, the candles, the bracelets. Mm. It's, 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 it's weak. Yeah. It's, it's ineffective. Yeah. And it's, it's embarrassing. I, I mean, we did it here with Boston during the Boston Marathon. The teddy bears. The teddy bears. They're blowing up children teddy bears and bracelets and lollipops and balloons and you know i mean wh what they're saying is is that we accept this mm. you know with manchester and then you have these manchester revival concerts you know uh, you know you are willing to accept the blowing up of children uh, who is more who is more vulnerable in a society who, who is, you know, these little girls going to Ariana Grande concert. I mean, that to me, if 9-11 wasn't and Madrid and Mumbai, you know, if, if how was Manchester not the, the woke moment? And you know what's fascinating is that we, when Manchester happened, we were told to get over it. Don't look back in anger is what we were called. You know that Oasis song that was, don't look back in anger. And yet we've had a, a you might have heard of this, a, the Grenfell fire. It was an accidental fire in, in a, an apartment block in London. Yes. And dozens of people were killed. It was a terrible tragedy. But oh. years later, we're still talking about that and still demanding someone be punished for this. Uh, and yet, it's the stark difference between an accidental fire and a deliberate terror threat. It really well, tells us. That's really all they have. I mean, it's the same, like New Zealand, Christchurch. Yeah. I mean, uh, when does anyone care about, talk about New Zealand? Um, seriously, I mean the whole world, okay? And they're using it in Western countries to enact legislation of what happened. Now, I gotta tell you, synagogues are attacked all the time. Churches have been wholesalely wiped out in the Middle East, and you never hear about it. It's just a talking point. It is, it, what it is, it, it's just a propaganda point. And what is alarming is that you have uh, the UK, you have the US, and you have Israel in the grips of mm -hmm. like a, a deep state coup. The fact that you, you haven't Brexited. You had a vote, mm -hmm. you know, the end, no. No, the beginning. And they will continue and they will continue and they will continue until they get the vote that they want. And that is, you know, my definition, really, of a civil war. Uh, I believe America is in a civil war right now. Uh, people think it's, you know, people think it's guns and it's, um, uh, you know, bombs. It's not guns that make a civil war. It's politics. And, you know, the fact is, how, you know, when you have two opposing sides, how do you decide who's going to run the country? You hold elections. Yeah. But, but when one side refuses to accept the results of the election, and this is what we're living through right now, you know, Trump won, and the establishment, the media, the Democrats, they have rejected the results. They have tortured this president with this Russia hoax 
for the first three years of the presidency, which actually turned on them because we found out, of course, that the dossier was fabricated and there was some UK involvement there with Chris Steele, but it was really the Democrats who had fictionalized this and used it to get these um, surveillance warrants, these FISA warrants on the president, a private citizen to spy on him and so on. And when that didn't work and they were exposed, they just jumped to um, this Ukraine to cover up Biden, uh, Biden's son who was getting literally millions of dollars. We've just seen some of the paperwork, the Ukrainian officials have released some of the paperwork where he's gotten over 46 payments totaling over $3 million. Nobody's talking about that. I mean, this is what they do. They, they, they reject the results of, of, of the election. They did it with Bush. They do it to every Republican president. And I think that, as I said before, nothing is static. Um, things are coming to a head. I believe things are coming to a head. If they impeach the, this president, and if you've been watching the hearings, I mean, it's all third and fourth hearsay. There's no evidence. It's hearsay by people that are Obama holdovers. I mean, this is, this would be a bad, this is a bad movie. Yeah. If you went to see it, you wouldn't believe it. Uh, I, it's going to be brutal. So, um, last question, if I may. I know we're keeping you longer than, than we said, but I could talk to you all night. Um, but last question, I mean, you must, you'll, you'll know uh, what's happening in Europe. And there are three major aspects to, and this is to go back to the, the Islam relationship with totalitarianism. We have a massive rise in anti-Semitism. Girls are not safe and our freedom of speech is gone absolutely gone uh, how are what tell us about those three things in america how far away from us is america how far behind us are you and will trump win again in 2020 okay so let's break it down uh the reason why it's so much further along in europe than it is in america is because you took in this massive migration Mm -hmm. It's like the late, great Karl Lagerfeld said, you know, you exterminated 6 million Jews and you brought in 20 million Jew haters. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. That and the left's sanction of Islamic Jew hatred, um, it was just a toxic, it was just a toxic combination. And that's what you're seeing. I mean, look, do I believe there, are, there were some skinheads in their basement who hated Jews? Yeah. 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 Uh, who cares? Uh, they were certainly not a movement. There's always going to be that. Uh, the Nazis were defeated. That was not a problem. And I'm Jewish. And I'm acutely aware of all these things. Uh, it comes packaged, this steaming pile of hate and dung come packaged in the, you know, uh, Israel box, as if the hatred of Israel is somehow disconnected from anti-Semitism. It is the very definition of anti-Semitism, as, as Martin Luther King said. Um, uh, you know, one needs to understand that uh, the state of Israel, a Jewish state, is deeply offensive and deeply humiliating to devout Muslims. That before 67, there was, and before 40, you know, 47, when, they, when, when the Jewish people won independence, uh, you know, uh, they expelled, a million Jews were expelled from Islamic countries. There were programs against the Jews in the British mandate of Palestine by, uh, by, by Muslims led by the Mufti al-Husseini, who was Hitler's partner. I know I'm going off here, but, you know, the Muslim world was partnered by Hitler. No one ever talks about that. The Germans certainly had a pay for World War II, but you never heard the Muslim world expressing any remorse for their role in, 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 in the Holocaust and, and the Mufti al-Husseini being responsible for the death of 400,000 Jewish women and children. And even before that, for goodness sake, it goes back to Muhammad, who exterminated an entire tribe of, Jewish, uh, of Jews, the Kariza tribe. Israel is... The, it's like Palestinianism. Palestinianism is just a euphemism for, man, for anti-Semitism. But back to your question. So you imported millions of Jew haters and you imported this um, uh, culture that if you read the Quran, know that the taking of infidel girls is a right. It is a right in Islam. And you had law enforcement in the UK, I don't have to tell you, who are looking away because they didn't want to be accused of racism. This is, uh, this is broken. Now, what Trump 
has tried to do, as you know, with the national security uh, restriction on travel, the travel ban, was he named, and it wasn't enough, by the way, it wasn't enough, naming seven countries where he would, he would not accept immigration, jihad nations. Now, you have to understand what a fight this was. It was so narrow. And these countries, by the way, were named by the Obama administration. No one ever said anything then. Because when the left is in, they can do anything they want at any time. And so, uh, you know, it's been, you know, everything has been a struggle. But what's so extraordinary about this President Trump that I've never seen in any leader on the right here is that the more they attack him, the more invigorated he gets. I mean, it's fantastic. <laughs> He's channeling for all of us. I, you know, this is what people didn't understand how in this field of very talented candidates, uh, Cruz and I, I, I like Cruz, uh, 17 men, how this man won. And I will tell you how he won, because he fought and because he didn't apologize. And we have not had that. We had weak sisters. We had uh, gutless, spineless wonders like John McCain and Mitt Romney, which we would say, okay, we'll take them, because the left was always worse. Hillary was a, a criminal. She was horrible. Uh, Obama, you saw what he did. You saw what he did with Iran. You saw what he did with Turkey. You saw what he did in Africa. You saw what he did with Libya. I mean, he was a jihad, really operative. I, that, that may sound harsh, but it's true. And so uh, this is why they're so vicious after Trump. He's wonderful. He's, in the he's, he's, he's exceeded our expectations on every level. That's why they, they've got to destroy him. They know there's no grounds for impeachment here. But the fact that they may be able to say, and I don't think they will, they have the House, as you know, and they're going to vote no matter what happens. The Senate, the Senate, I don't think will pass him. They're just trying to destroy his election, uh, re-election chances for 2020 because you must understand something. He's enormously popular. Not for any other reason, even if you're not, even if you're an American who's not political, you, you know, you know, because under President Obama, unemployment was 10 percent. Now it's three and a half. People have more money in their pockets. Yeah. There are jobs. There's so many things happening. I think it is likely that he will be reelected. If he doesn't, I can tell you unequivocally, it will be the end of America as a free society. Well, let's hope he is re-elected then, because if it's the end of America, it's the end of the West. You know what President, you know what President Obama said about yeah. Trump's election? Yeah. He said, it's just a speed bump. They have big plans. And this is the problem on the right. It's, the right has long underestimated the left and the lanes they will go to. It's a war. This yeah. is not a, a, an argument. This is a war and they will do anything and they will say anything to win. And we have got, not that we should do the same, but we've got to have the same will to fight. We must. I mean, people on the right, just, they, they, they just give up. That, it's just the worst thing you could do. Even you had the, the, the greatest leader in modern time, Winston Churchill. It's always dark. As before the, he, had the, he, he said these great things. They're not just cliches. It's really true. You have to fight. You have to fight or, or it's over. Well, fantastic way to, to bring this to an end. Pamela Geller, what can I say? Thank you so much. I hope that you are safe. I hope that you feel safe. Um, I hope that we, and I know that we can win this fight. Uh, and I thank you personally for the inspiration that you've given me over the years. And I sincerely mean that. Thank you. You're a sister. And when, when the day comes that a four Britain wins, I just want you to know, I'm coming to the festivities. Okay. I, I will expect to be invited. I expect, okay. to get the, I expect to get into the country at that point, and I'll be there. Thank you so much for having Thank me. Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks. Thank you.